Hi, good afternoon, uh, Governor Kua. Hello, this is Sheila. I just want to know if you will do the slide transition from your device. Um, hello, Sheila. Uh, is it possible for for someone else to? Yes, definitely, sir. Uh, we, we are willing to do it. However, we need a copy of your PowerPoint presentation. We don't have it yet. According to um to Carmen, she already um send the file to us. However, we haven't received it until now. Pwede po kayang paki-email dun sa... Thank you. Sige. Opo. Can Thank you, you, sir. Can you take date the... How can I get your email? Um, Actually, you sent me a message just a while ago saying that uh -huh. you, you will be using your iPad. Is that you? Uh, yes. 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 Okay. okay. All yes, right. sir. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hi, Governor okay. Kua. Hello. I'm Justine Sikat. It's nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. Yeah, uh, I met your parents a long time ago. I think two decades ago. I don't know if they will remember me. <laughs> I, I, send them my regards. <laughs> tell them. I'll tell uh -huh. them. Thank you. Um, okay. So, G Governor, going back to your to your uh, PowerPoint presentation, in case you need us to uh, go to the next slide, just uh, say next. Will that okay. be okay? Salamat okay. po. Thank you. I'll send it now. Huh? Salamat. Sure, sir. Thank you. From Anna. Good afternoon, Jacinto. Hi, Justin. <laughs> Thank you. Buti could make it. Salamat. 
essas boas. <laughs> Opo. Eh, kasama din daw po tayo from PMGM. Ano yan? Oo, nandiyan sila. Okay, sige. Thank you lang. Hello? Hello, Sheila? Hi, Mama Anna. Uh, hi, it's Carmen. Me, Carmen. Is you? Hi, Carmen. We haven't did not receive the email. I did. Pa po. Hindi pa po. I did uh, several times. I said. Yes, Um. although... So the governor will send it to you? Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, Hello? We will be uh, on Facebook. We are already on Facebook Live. So, Carmen, we are already on Facebook Live. Hi, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, we will start in three minutes, so we, we, we request everyone to settle down. So see you po at two o'clock.
Oh, ayan na, ayan na, ayan na. Ayan na. Hi, Justine. Hi, hello, Pat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good news, ah, okay. yung, yung, yung session. Even the panelists. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, we're just waiting for yung final confirmation from uh, uh, Associate Justice Marvick Yonin. Oh, but otherwise, so, otherwise, okay. That's wonderful. I'll, I'll forward the email after okay. the... Uh -huh. Hi, okay. Just, hi, Justine and, and uh, Peng. Uh, we are on Facebook Live now. Ah, okay, so I'll mute my mic. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second of the three-part webinar series on promoting good local governance in the Philippines, jointly organized by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, and the Department of the Interior, or Interior and Local Government, or DILG. I am Sheila Sierra of PIDS, and I will be your moderator. Before we start, may I remind you about our house rules. For all attendees, you may have noticed that your microphone is muted upon entry, and this is to prevent any background noise. This doesn't mean that you cannot join the discussion. Uh, to join the open forum, just use the chat box, which is located at the lower part of the screen. Just type your name and your affiliation and your question, and I will read your question during the open forum. You may type your question uh, and make sure that it's concise because we have limited time. You may type your question uh, while the uh, presentation is in progress or during the open forum. For those who are watching us on a uh, Facebook, um, of course, you are very much welcome to, to participate in the discussion. Just use the comment section of Facebook. Again, a warm welcome to all of you, to all our Facebook viewers and to our uh, participants on WebEx. As I mentioned earlier, we are conducting this webinar in partnership with the DILG. And for this webinar, we will look into the performance incentive program for our LGUs, which seeks to motivate them to perform well and uphold core governance values. And to formally open our event and share her insights about the topic, may I call on the Vice President of uh, PIDS, Dr. Marife Ballesteros. Thank Yeah, thank you, Sheila. To our colleagues from the government and representatives from the academe, civil society, and the private sector, good afternoon and welcome to this webinar. Uh, this is organized by the PIDS and the Department of Interior and Local Government. This is actually the second of three-part webinar series that features PIDS studies on local governance, performance, and challenges in planning, budgeting, and fund utilization. Uh, this was, these studies were conducted in collaboration with the LG. In the first uh, webinar series that we held last July 16, the topic was about fiscal and governance gaps among municipalities. For this uh, uh, afternoon, our focus is on how local governance has been improved to the national government's incentives and awards program such as the Performance Challenge Fund, or the PCF, and the Seal of Good Local Governance, or the SGLG, which were both uh, implemented by the ILG. Uh, the PCF is the performance-based program that provides financial incentives to local governments for attaining a certain level of good governance. While the SGLG is the performance assessment tool used to establish LGU's eligibility to qualify for the PCF. Uh, this uh, system of 
incentives has actually been uh, institutionalized through the enactment of Republic Act 11292 or the Seal of Good Local Govern Governance Act of 2019. So this provides us the legal basis for a continuous uh, funding for the program. But more than that, we hope that uh, LGUs will be uh, encouraged to perform better and, and to efficiently deliver better services, aside, of course, from the basic objective of the, the program, which is to align the local uh, development initiatives with our national government goals. So, uh, our, our own, very own PIDS research fellow, Dr. Uh, Justine Joknos Sikat, will present the results of the study uh, entitled Assessment of the Performance Challenge Fund and the Seal of Good Local Governance from the perspective of uh, municipalities. This study is based on a nationwide survey of municipalities that looked into the usefulness, compliance, and importance of PCF and SGLG to LGUs. We also have invited uh, Kirino Provincial Governor Dakila Kua uh, and World Bank Lead Governance Specialist, Dr. Uh, Lewis Hawk, in this afternoon's webinar as discussants. Uh, welcome, uh, Governor Kua and uh, Dr. Hawk. And uh, may I take also this opportunity to thank the ILG and its officials for their continued partnership with PIDS in the conduct of evidence-based research and their support in organizing this webinar series. I would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Director uh, Anna Banagua of the ILG and the team lead for the DILG SG, SLGP project, uh, Mr. Richard Villacorte. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of our local chief executives. We have several mayors on, online. Mayor Jesus Vargas of Abulog, Tagayan. Mayor Riza Pama, Pama, Pamorada of Alcantara, Roblon. Mayor Milagros uh, Faderanga of, uh, of um, Banton, Roblon. Mayor Nathaniel Escobar of Burgos, Ilocos Sur. Uh, Mayor Virginia Perandos of Carmen Davao del Norte, Mayor Dean Dilia of Larena Siquijor, Mayor Roberto Uy of Liloy Zamboanga del Norte, Mayor Cesar Robles of Panganiban Catanduanes, Mayor Acelas Sacramed of Sanchez Mira Cagayan, Mayor William Lim of San Narciso Zambales, Mayor Francis Ong of San Vicente Camarines Norte, and also we have the Vice Mayor of uh, Libaco Aklan, Mr. Uh, Vincent Navarosa, and the Vice Mayor of, of uh, Banton Roblon, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Loy Hor Fegalan. So from the government sector, we have uh, Assistant Commissioner Marietta Lorenzo of BIR, Yusek uh, Laura Pasqua of DBM, uh, Executive Director Mervyn Salazar of CEPO, Provincial Director uh, John Cerezo, and uh, Duel Duarte, the LG Provincial Directors, and Executive Director Thelma Vecina of L LGA. From the academe, we have Dean Kalina of the DAP Graduate School of Public and Development Management, uh, Dean um, Marik of Cavite State University College of Criminal Justice, Dean Fernandez of the University of Makati's College of Governance and Public Policy. And from the civil society, we have uh, Dr. Antonio Avila of Logodev, of Logodev, Logodev National Coordinator, Mr. Albert Aquino of Code NGO, um, the Executive Director D Dini, Ocampo of Code NGO, and uh, Chairman Mario Ian Mosquisa of Eastern Visayas Network, oh, the Eastern Visayas Network. We also would like to welcome our own uh, PIDS Board of Trustees, Dr. Gilbert Lianto. So uh, thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to hearing your insights during the open forum. Back to you, Sheila. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Balyasteras. Our presenter, Dr. Justine Siket, is, is an assistant professor at the Virate School of Business, University of the Philippines, and currently on secondment at the PIDS as a research fellow. She has a PhD in business administration, is a PhD economics candidate, has two master's degrees, one in management and the other in economics, all from UP Diliman. Her uh, academic and professional experience is focused on the various aspects of the public sector and public policy. Here now is Dr. Justin Sikat for her presentation. Justine? Yes, thank you, Sheila. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you to all those attending here. I'd also like to thank the PIDS RID for organizing this and our moderator, Sheila, as well as the team that um, helped work this out. We've been um, working on this for the past two years. So we have also, I'd like to thank Alma Mariano, Catherine Adaro, uh, Rixi Madawin, Angel Castillo, Lucy Melendez, and also from the DILG, of course, Program Director Richard Villacorte with Director Bonagua, A.A. A. Salazar, and Glenn Miranda. So let me go on to the presentation of the results of our study, looking at the Performance Challenge Fund, and the seed of good local governance through the lens of municipal governance. Now, in order to give you a bit of context, this is actually, as mentioned earlier, a continuation of the presentation last July 16, where uh, we presented the results of the baseline study on fiscal and governance gaps in municipalities. So the results of that particular study was based on a survey of 1,300 73 municipalities, which showed that in 2017, there was at least a 166.9 billion fiscal gap for key infrastructure, municipal roads, primary evacuation centers, and rural health units. In addition to that, the baseline study also tackled the development planning practices of municipalities and the survey that we conducted pertained to the DILG prescribed planning process. And what we found in that study was that there is a need to update local plans for more than half of the municipalities we surveyed. Uh, we're talking about the comprehensive land use plan, the comprehensive development plan, as well as the local development investment programs. And we also found that there was a need to strengthen the identification prioritization, and monitoring and evaluation of these investment programs. Now, for today, our presentation will focus on the Performance Challenge Fund and the seal of good local governance and the perceptions of municipal officials that are involved in the planning team. So my outline would be the definitions, research questions, and objectives, the scope and methodology, the results and findings, and the recommendation. Very, very simple. Now, the Performance Challenge Fund is a performance-based incentive program that gives financial subsidies to local government units that are awarded the seal of good local governance. It has evolved in coverage and eligibility criteria since its introduction in 2010. The seal of local, good local governance took the place of the seal of good housekeeping in 2014. It symbolizes integrity and good performance of local governance. It is a progressive performance management system that focuses on LGU capacity, the ability to deliver in terms of system, structure, mechanisms, plans, and budgets. It also focuses on governance principles such as transparency, participation, and accountability. And finally, it focuses on LGU performance in terms of the accomplishment of plan, fund utilization, and frontline service delivery. The recently passed SGLG Act of 2019 now institutionalizes these two programs in the form of still the SGLG, but the SGLG Incentive Fund now replacing the um, Performance Challenge Fund. Now, my research questions and objectives are very simple. How do municipalities perceive the Performance Challenge Fund and the seal of good local governance? Are there trends in the characteristics or behavior of recipient, non-recipient municipalities? And the objectives therefore following the questions are, we are 
we gathered perceptions of municipal government officials uh, regarding the performance challenge fund and the seat of good local governance. The survey we conducted focused that the, the respondents were the municipal planning team, the municipal planning and um, development officer, the municipal engineer, the uh, budget officer or accountant, and a representative from the CSO who was present during the last planning process uh, at that particular municipality. We also plan to profile characteristics of the recipient and non-recipient local governments of the seal. So the methodology data and limitations. So we apply a very simple mixed methods approach using descriptive research design, desk review and analysis. But we use primary data, as I mentioned earlier, from the baseline study survey of municipalities, as well as secondary data from national government sources. So we also depended heavily on the PCF portal where we got a lot of information as well. Now, the study focuses only on the awareness of the PCF by the planning team, the effect of the PCF on drafting local vision, mission plans, and budgeting, and the perceptions on the success of or challenges with the PCF. So you have to understand that when we conducted the survey with regard to the planning process and whether the municipalities followed the DRG prescribed planning process, we also added a section pertaining to the PCF and its relevance to the planning process, as well as the perceptions of the municipal planning team members regarding the PCF and the SGLG. Now, let me give you a timeline of the PCF and the SGLG, as well as its predecessor, the seed of good housekeeping. So please excuse this rather heavy um, slide, but Let's focus primarily on the upper quarter of this slide, which looks at the progression of the PCF since its introduction in 2010 until 2013. So in 2010, the PCF was introduced and it was intended only for the poorer LGU income classes, for fourth to sixth income class. And um, the basis of being being eligible for the PCF was what we called at the time the seal of good housekeeping. So um, this was the criteria upon which to evaluate fourth to sixth income class LGUs. And the criteria were only two. So there were just two. The absence of negative COA findings in the LGU financial statements, as well as the compliance to the full disclosure policy. Now the full disclosure policy, I also studied this at the time. This was relatively new. Uh, in 2010, it, uh, I think if I recall correctly, it was about 10 or 11 reports that had to be submitted and had to be posted in visible areas in the locality so that anyone can check if the municipality was satisfying the full disclosure policy. Right now, I think there are more, about 16 reports that, that are included in this full disclosure policy. But um, going back, 2010, when this was implemented, uh, they observed that there was very low uptake of this particular uh, facility, the PCF facility, um, perhaps because also one of the conditions for um, taking that grant would be there would be a counterpart by the LG. So in 2011, there were several issuances that expanded the coverage of the um, PCF to include third income class uh, local government units, but those with higher poverty incidents were the ones that were prioritized, as well as the removal of the counterpart requirement for, for, for the grant. So that's what happened in 2010 and 2011. So come 2012 and 2013, the coverage of the PCF now expanded to all LGUs, and there were two additional criteria that were introduced. And this was the compliance to the Government Procurement Reform Act, as well as the anti-red tape report card survey of the Civil Service Commission. And um, from this, in 2014, the seal of good local governance was introduced, but it was applied only in 2015, which is why we indicate here that it's uh, 2015 to 2016 that the SGLG criteria at the time applied. Now, the SGLG criteria was expanded 
um, for eligibility. And this included the three core components plus one essential component. So this means that if an LGU wanted to become eligible or to be awarded the skill, that LGU should satisfy all of the indicators in, or the criteria in the three core components, plus choose one essential component. And this was consistent evaluation for 2015 to 2016. So the core components were financial administration, of which some of the earlier, the good uh, seal of good housekeeping became seal of good financial housekeeping. Um, were included here. So this was just expanded. There was also disaster preparedness as a core component and social protection. The essential components at the time were peace and order, business friendliness and competitiveness, environmental management, and tourism, culture, and the arts. The, if I recall correctly, this is rather uh, a newer uh, component. Now in 2017, we take a look here at the lower portion of the slide, the 2017 SGLG criteria progressed, okay, to be needing for satisfying the four core components, core components, which now included peace and order. And then choosing one essential component from business friendliness, competitiveness, and environmental management, tourism, culture, and the arts. So it now became four plus one. Now, um, as of the writing of the study, which was last year, the SGLG criteria in 2018 and 2019 were all in. So this is the coverage of this particular study up until 2019. Okay. Now, this would give you a brief example of the governance assessment report for the core components, the initial three core components. Now, I will uh, zoom it in a bit. Uh, let me zoom it in. And I'd like to focus. So here we see financial administration, we see disaster preparedness, and then we see social protection. These were the initial three core components. Now I'd like to spend a bit of time on financial administration criteria number five, which deals with fund utilization or the completion of NGE supported capital investment programs. So under here, we would have 5.1, which is the utilization of the 20% component for e of ERA for development projects. And this is basically the local development fund. So by the local government code, municipalities, all LGUs actually, are mandated to spend at least 20% of the ERA that they receive that year for development projects that are identified primarily in the local development investment programs. And if you were able to listen in to the presentation last July 16, a COA report we cited there showed that the, the, in 2016 and 2017, local governments utilized only about 76% of what was mandated to be utilized for the local development fund. Now, why is this a concern? Well, this, is, this has a huge implication when it comes to development and economic growth in a locality because these development projects have the largest fiscal multiplier. If you spend in your locality on, let's say, building infrastructure, that means you would create the demand for supplies as well as create employment, which would increase the income of your suppliers as well as your um, those who are employed, which would give them more spending power and then further increasing the demand for goods and services. So that's the fiscal multiplier that, that we're talking about here. Now, one of the consistent concerns of the national government oversight agencies really is how to ensure that local governments really do um, fulfill the mandate of spending at least 20% of the component of ERA. Now, as it is right now, the the way that so this is a criteria under that com, at the, under the core component this criteria in order for you to pass you will be evaluated based on benchmarks so in the case of 5.1 the benchmarks are differentiated across levels of government so for example provinces cities and municipalities have different benchmarks for the utilization of the um, development local development fund for you to, to pass. So let's say for provinces in 2019, based on the issue once 2019-44 of the DILG, for provinces, the benchmark is 
um, for cities, it's 55%, and for municipalities, it's 66%. So if the LGUs, the municipality, was able to spend at least 66% of the mandated at least 20%, then they would be considered as fast. So this is um, also a concern, especially because of the anticipated infusion of funds once the Mandana's uh, Supreme Court ruling will be implemented. That means a larger era will be given to local governments. Therefore, a larger proportion of this era must be spent for development projects. So I know that the, the SGLG Council and all national government oversight agencies and local governments are trying to figure out how to improve the utilization of this. So that gives us an example of differentiation of the benchmarks of criteria across different levels of LGUs. There are also examples of the differentiation of the benchmarks across income classes within a level of LG. And what do I mean by this? If we take a look at disaster preparedness, there is the requirement that there should be a disaster risk reduction and management officer. Now, the DILG issue once 2019-44 distinguishes this requirement or sort of loosens this requirement for poorer municipalities that have challenges in attaining the PS cap versus the richer municipalities. So for the richer municipalities, the issue one says that the first to third income class, there should be a designated staff supplement. So for the poorer municipalities, the it could be a head or a plantilla train. So that would be fine. So they they loosen it. So there are criteria that are across the board the same criteria, but the benchmarks are what varies when it comes to, for sometimes, level of government or for sometimes uh, income class within a level of government. So um, thank you. Now, this next slide shows the PCF statistics. It, the line, the blue line, would show just the budget, um, the allocation that the SGLG has received in the past uh, nine years. And as you can see here, since 2015, it's relatively received about a billion pesos in the budget for every year. Now, the column here is not monetary value, but it is the number of LGU recipients of the PCF. So in the earlier years of the PCF that were based on the seal of good housekeeping, the, you can see here a, a sharp increase in the number of um, awarded, those awarded, and those uh, beneficiaries of the PCF program. However, when you see that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in 2014, there was a shift to the SGLG, which was applied in the assessment in 2015. So 2015 and 2016, as I mentioned earlier, the criteria of three plus one was relatively consistent. But the, the, in 2017, it now became a four plus one. And in 2018, it was now all in. So the numbers decreased in 2018. Uh, although in 2019, if you take a look at the updated figures, it increased slightly to about 300. So this is just to give you a picture of the budgetary um, uh, complement given for this, for the SGLG, as well as the recipients. Now, what are the existing studies on the PCF? Well, back in 2012, World Bank and us conducted a rapid assessment of the, uh, in 20, of the 2011 SGH and PCF program. And they found that while LGUs appreciated the financial assistance from the PCF, the potential benefits were likely weakened by the ineffective communication and information dissemination. Um, Medina Gucci more recently, this is SAR, found that overall LGU performance improved 2014 to 2016 when LGUs were assessed with relatively the same criteria, which is why I highlighted that earlier. However, among the levels of government, there were different trends. There was a downward trend of provincial, municipal, and highly organized performance, and an upward trend for component and independent component cities. And she attributed this to differences in the level of difficulty of the assessment criteria for LGU type. She also observed that there are differences in general learning retention ability among local government levels 
the observation was because, um, as I showed also, there are some that, that win, LGUs would win one year and then would not win the award the next year. So there is inconsistent behavior as well there. If you would like to read more on this, I think you can take a look at this, this paper by uh, Medina Gusha, 2019. Now to present the results of the baseline study survey, we have here, we ask the question, do S does SGLG criteria affect the municipal vision goals and policies? Because this is the second step in the development planning process as prescribed by the DILG to review the vision, the goals, and the policies of your LG. And for this, about 73% of the recipients claim that the seal of good local governance criteria did affect the vision and policy options, goals, and objectives. About 8.4% claims existing vision policy options, objectives, and priorities were already aligned. However, another 8.6% said that they have other priorities or standards, and they respond more to the needs of constituents and sometimes consider the criteria to be irrelevant. Now, this is very interesting. This shows you the profile of the CO passers and non-passers. And let me explain to you first what these are. So in the stacked column, the blue color represents the proportion of municipal passers in the region. So they're grouped by region here. And the orange, yellow orange part of the stack column would be the non passers, the proportion of municipalities that are non passers in the region. So as you can see here, it's ranked from car region one, from left to right, okay, car region one, all the way to Caraga and to the NCR here. Now in the NCR, it's quite unique because there is only one municipality uh, and it has, according to our study, uh, the results, it's never received the seal of uh, good local governance. Um, so let's highlight first the regions that have the highest or the largest proportion of non-passers. More than a third of their municipalities have not ever received the seal. These are the Bicol Central and Eastern Visayas regions. So you take a look here, this is region five, 40% of the municipalities in region five have not received the seal of good local governance. In region eight, 64% have not received the seal of good local governance. And in region seven, 34% have not received the seal of good local governance. If we want to use 30% as our benchmark or just a little bit below a third, we can also add here region nine. So region nine had uh, about 30% of uh, their municipalities not ever receiving the seal. Now we also grouped or profiled the passers and non-passers by income class. So there are six income classes and the stack columns are still defined the same. So the green part of the stack column would be the SGLG passers. So the proportion of first class municipalities that have received at least once the um, seal. The orange, yellow, orange part would be the proportion of municipalities that have not received since the, the seal was, uh, since the PCF was introduced in 2010. So as you can see here, so it's ranked first to sixth, okay? The poorer ones are the fourth to the sixth. And if you can notice here, there is, it's for the fifth and sixth income classes that there is more than a third of the proportion of municipalities that have not received uh, the seal. And it's very interesting because if you recall at the beginning, the seal of, the seal of good housekeeping in 2010 and the PCF was really initially intended for the poorer uh, LGUs, but it had to be expanded because uh, the, the budget for it was not being utilized. So it's very interesting to see this. Um, this next slide shows us the profile or the repeat municipal SGLG recipients by income class. So SGLG or SGH, okay, that's what we mean by income class. So what does this mean? So let me just briefly describe the legend. So the blue column, so they're grouped by income class first to sixth, 
Okay, the blue column represents the two times, okay, two times recipient. Uh, the yellow column represents three times recipient. The red column represents four times recipient. The green column represents five times. The violet one represents six times. And the magenta or the fuchsia one represents seven times. So how would we read this? So this would be the proportion of those in the first of municipalities in the first income class have received the FGLG at least twice. At least twice, so 100% all of them. Now, only more than half of them have received the SGLG, the first income class, have received the SGLG three times. And then only a little bit more than, uh, well, a third of them uh, received the SGLG four times. Uh, more than 20% received the SGLG five times. And then we have the six times. And what's interesting to see here is that uh, there are poorer income class municipalities that have received at least twice. So it says here, 100% uh, of the fourth income class municipalities received the seal at least twice. So it, the, the, the satisfying or being rewarded the seal may depend on income, yes, but not necessarily. There's also the human factor of governance because even the poorer municipalities can um, were two times recipients or three times recipients, uh, four times recipients. So that's what's interesting about this particular slide. That's something I'd like to highlight. Now, in the survey, we asked some municipalities um, why they were left behind. So why are some municipalities left behind? There were about 294 municipalities, mostly lower income, that have never been recipients of the PCF grant because they never received the seal. Now, 453 of the municipalities, 33% asserted that sometimes this, the criteria are too difficult or too stringent. Um, the reasons given were, let's say, we group them by component. So most of those who were not able to avail or to be awarded the seal identified the lack of plans, particularly either the land use plan, the hazard map, or the SIGA plan as the main reason. So a lot of them identified this, about three to three. The second that was identified was the, the absence of, or the unfilled mandatory positions. This was another commonly identified reason. Now the third ranking identified reason was no fund utilization or adverse COA opinion. And this was under financial administration. And then we have the lack of, again, manpower as under the DRRMO. So these are the reasons given by disaster preparedness, by financial administration, by social protection. The reason was because of the lack of PWD accessibility in the local government. In the case of environmental management, uh, no landfill was identified. And peace and order, which is now identified to be a core, um, a core function. What is interesting also in the other reasons here is that some claim, but this is very little, only about 12 of the respondents claim that they were not aware or they had little knowledge of the PCF. <clears throat> so also, if you take a look at the slide, um, the PCF as a source of financing and um, perceived purpose. So we asked municipalities, do you think that the PCF is an important source of financing or not? We just wanted to get their perception <clears throat> so that they we would see how they felt about the program what its purpose was. <clears throat> so about 79% of the municipalities asserted that it is in, in fact an important source of financing. And their top two perceived purposes were that it's another source of financing, yes, but it's also a motivation to improve governance, allowing them to perform better for the benefit of the people. So these were the top two perceived purposes. We asked them to enumerate what they perceived the purpose of the PCF was. Now, 13% or 175 of municipalities said that the PCF is not an important source of financing. And the top reason cited by these LGUs was that first, the grant is too small. And this would happen when, as I mentioned earlier, if you have a fixed cap and you have an increasing number of LGUs that satisfy or get the seal or become eligible. Of course, 
dividing it across a larger number would reduce the, this, the amount received per uh, award. So the second top reason identified by LG is, well, they claim that the standards criteria are too stringent. And there are some oils so that surprisingly think that the TCF does not apply to low-class municipalities. The remaining 8% or the 103 municipalities did not give an answer. Okay, so a summary of the findings with regard to the evolution of the TCF and the SGLG. So there is evident desire to improve and progress the implementation and the design of the TCF the seed of good housekeeping and the seed of good local governance as well as identified earlier. But there's also a challenge in balancing incentivizing poor LGUs, but ensuring also the utilization of the facility. And this was done um, by relaxing some preconditions, meaning we included um, richer uh, LGUs as in the coverage and removing the counterpart requirement. Second, we also learned that there was uh, continuing improvements in transparency, accountability, and local governance by adding additional criteria in performance evaluation, but also considering the varied capacity of LGUs to comply. And lastly, the evolution also showed that there were uh, efforts to address administrative procedural concerns to facilitate, facilitate fund utilization. So this would be the removal of the counterpart as well. Now, the summary of findings in the survey results. So here, poor municipalities are a larger proportion of non-passers of the SGLG, who therefore are not eligible to avail of the PCF. Repeat SGLG recipients come mostly from the first to fourth income classes. So it's the poorer ones, uh, again, who are mm, non uh, have fewer repeat SGLG, who are fewer repeat SGLG recipients. Uh, BQAL, Eastern Visayas, and Central Visayas regions have more than 30% of the municipalities as non passers of the SGLG. And the lack of plans, such as the DRR, the SIDRA, or the CDP, were identified as one of the main reasons for not passing. And this is very interesting because the results of the baseline study, which I presented last uh, two weeks ago, July 16, also found that although the claim was that there were CDPs present, for municipalities, there were only about 40% of those who said yes that were updated. For the LDIP, there were less than 30% that were updated. And for the CLUPs, there were just about 5% of those who said that they had the CLUPs that were updated. So this is consistent with the, with the, the findings here. Okay, what are the recommended uh, recommendations? What are the objectives of the program? The institutionalization of these programs in the SGLG Act of 2019 is the opportune time to consider other aims and rethink the incentive structure of this particular program. Clearly, the overall objective is to recognize good LGU performance, but is it to reward the best or be an aspiration? Then progressively adding criteria or increasing benchmarks would satisfy this. This would be the way to go if you only want to reward the best of the best. But if you want to ensure that no LGU is left behind in terms of governance, then there should also be focus on LGUs that have never received the SGLG. Uh, perhaps, although I leave this up to the policymakers, part of the fund could be allocated specifically for the laggard LGUs. Though, of course, we have to carefully balance the disincentive effects of such. Um, there should be an exit strategy or a sunset clause or a limitation up until when these LGUs would be um, assisted or handheld, um, as in any of the targeted programs of the national government. Now, recommendations in terms of incentivizing and institutionalization of this program. So in incentivizing performance, the current design um, translates into a smaller grant amount per recipient with an increase in the number of passers because of a fixed budget, one billion divided by an increasing award, uh, number of recipients would give you smaller grants per recipient. Now, at the same time, there is, an, there is evidence of a larger proportion of ineligible LGUs being poorer and more predominant in certain regions. And this would ex suggest expanding the differentiation of criteria 
or benchmarks for these MGPs. So like the example I gave earlier in case of DRR, there were considerations given for poorer LG uh, municipalities versus richer municipalities. So the SGLG Council could also perhaps consider this as they are drafting the um, implementing rules and regulations for this particular law. Now, another concern is the inconsistent performance of SGLG recipients. Um, once sometimes they, they receive the award, sometimes they not because this could be because of the claims that some LGUs do not know of the facility or have different priorities. So information campaigns must be considered by this SGLG Council to institutionalize this. But this is actually a very interesting result. Part of our baseline study also, we asked regarding the, the planning officer of each of the municipality the extent of their service or how long they were in service as a planning officer. And the results show that on the average, the planning officer has been there for 13 years on average. So it's not, it may not necessarily be institutional memory regarding the PCF or the SGLG. That might be the challenge. There could be other things at play. Um, for example, in Region 9, they have the longest um, average of service of the planning officer to be almost 16 years, okay? But if you can recall earlier, I showed you that up to 30% of municipalities in Region 9 are non-passers. So there's something else at play with regard to this. Maybe they need to improve their technical capacity or they need to be capacity training. While as in Region 12, um, this has the shortest uh, length, average length of um, uh, planning officer being in that position. And this is at the average 11 years in Region 12. But they have only 7% of their municipalities that are non-passers. So, so there, there, it seems that if you base it on the extent of the length of service in office of the planning officer, there should be some institutional recall. Um, for this PCF in the SGLG program. Okay. Now, finally, on the last slide, recommendations regarding capacity building. Uh, it's, it's nice and good to know that Section 13 of the SGLG Act says that concerned national government agencies should provide technical assistance for capacity building for identified gaps of LGUs which have not qualified for the SGLG award. So again, there is now focus again for those who have not qualified for the SGLG award. Now, another study I presented last Thursday was that uh, looking at the local government planning and budget framework is that the DILG along with the NEDA, they have this uh, PDP program that offers capacity building in identifying outcome indicators to be aligned with your development, local development plans and how to manifest this into physical projects and programs. So that could be something that could be tapped also for this. Now, well, a word, so here, these capacity building programs should not just create awareness and concrete steps to addressing the identified gaps, but also highlight the importance of the objective of continuously improved governance and its link to the development of the LGU over and above the perceived difficulty in receiving the seed. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justine, for your presentation and to give their perspectives on the issues uh, discussed by Dr. Seacott. We invited uh, two experts and they will comment on their um, studies, findings and recommendations. And they will also share their insights on how we could probably improve the design and implementation of uh, the SGLG and the PCF. And our first discussant is uh, the governor of the province of Quirino. Ensuring his stint as congressman, he was the chairman of the House Committees on Ecology and Ways and Means, as well as the senior vice chairperson of the House Committees on Appropriations, Economic Affairs, and Constitutional Amendments. His advocacies include health and education, infrastructure, agriculture, and livelihood. As a legislator, he was uh, uh, the principal author, one of the principal authors of the train law and author of the rice tariffication law, ease of doing business act and the Philippine competition law. 
Recently, he was elected as the National Chairman of the League of Provinces of the Philippines and the National President of the Union of Local Authorities of the Philippines. Um, the Union of Local Authorities of the Philippines, or ULAP, is the umbrella organization of all leagues of local government units and elected local officials in the country. Friends, here now is Governor Dakila Kua. Governor? Sheila, and um, I'd like to thank the organizers and, of course, uh, um, Ms. Justine Sika for a very comprehensive study evaluation. Um, today, I will be sharing the Quirino experience. Uh, what ano yung mga naging, uh, uh, experience na aming probinsya uh, about the SGLG? We can move to the next slide, please. Uh, gusto ko rin lang batiin lahat ng mga local officials dito. Mga kapwa ko, mga governors, mga mayors, uh, councillors, board members, uh, vice mayors and vice governors sa inyo lahat. A pleasant day. So, uh, this is the outline of my presentation. Konting pakilala na aming uh, probinsya, the Quirino province. And then I will delve a little bit into our challenges. Um, and then, of course, number three is our SGLG and our performance challenge fund experience number four is our reflection on uh, our brief reflection on the study of uh, miss sikat and the team and number five of course is how sglg and pcf uh, made an impact in our province and in, in our people okay next so yung po ang kirino province uh, is in that uh, tiny red circle on the map um, our income class is third class. Our population on the last census of 2015 was 192,000. Um, it's a little over 200,000 today. The number of households back then was 46,000, which is around uh, 60,000 today. And the uh, total land area is about 3,000 square kilometers. Our era share in 2016 was about 700 million, about almost 800 in 2017 and just uh, this year was the first time we breached the 1 billion mark so as an important note about uh, Kirino province is it is an important headwater or watershed of the Cagayan River which emanates from Kirino and regarded as one of the most important watershed havens in region 2 next Okay, so these are our challenges. Um, very simply put, um, quite limited livelihood options. Um, Kirino in the map shown earlier is landlocked and therefore there is no um, sea fishing in our province. So it's, it's uh, freshwater fishing, um, agriculture, livestock, etc. And then we have very limited uh, market linkage. Our province is not traversed by, by the Pan-Philippine Highway and therefore uh, linkage is quite a challenge. Um, there are unsustainable upland uh, or mountain agricultural practices, which is a problem in our environmental management um, challenge. And then uh, farm to market roads and ecotourism roads is still something that we keep and continually work on. And uh, high poverty incidents uh, in general is one of the challenges. Next. Okay, so the Kirina province consistently passed the seal of good housekeeping from 2010 to 13 and the seal of good local governance or sglg from 2014 to 18. so yun po yung, we proudly display that in the entrance of our capital <laughs> next please okay so um this is our sglg operational platform as uh, according to republic act 11292 or the new law that um that institutionalizes SGLG. So you will see there that um, we, these are the components that uh, that we are. Uh, th these are the core components and essential components that we are uh, um, putting focus on. So social protection, disaster preparedness, 
business friendliness and competitiveness, peace and order, environmental management, and of course, tourism is our one of one of our economic drivers. And uh, on the right side, you will see our all-in criteria um, in the seven governance areas: uh, financial administration, disaster preparedness, social protection, peace and order, business friendliness and competitiveness, environmental protection, and Again, tourism, culture, and the arts. So, yan yung mga criteria. Next, please. So, paano ba namin na-achieve? Um, I have to give credit where credit is due. And most of these achievements are due to the past governor who shares my last name, <laughs> who is my father. And the team that continues to help me today. So the same team continues to help me today in, uh, in trying to maintain this performance. So they, we have a, good, a very good planning team. Um, we have constant guidance and encouragement and collaboration with the ILG. Uh, we take into account the importance of CBMS that provides complete disaggregated data to evidence-based planning um, and the PLGU or the, the provincial government provided financial support to all our municipalities to complete their CBMS. Yun yung isang important dyan, yung collaboration between the provincial and municipal level. Um, number two is our pre-assessment activity. The provincial government and the DILG conducts uh, pre-assessment on the performance of the municipalities as per SGLG. This action requires uh, readiness to comply and complete all the needed requirements in order to pass the assessment. And this pre-assessment is being cascaded to all municipalities through the SGLG Technical Assistant, Assistance Team. So meron kaming hand-holding na tinutulungan natin ang lahat ng mga municipalities. Next, please. Okay, so... Um, in the implementation of the PPAs, uh, the impacts of the PPAs to the lives of the people are considered seriously. So, hindi lang basta uh, ma-achieve yung target according to the reports. Ang importante talaga, uh, may transformation, may impact do sa buhay ng mga constituents. Kasi that's, that's what it's all about anyway. <laughs> okay, next please. Okay, so um, earlier on, even prior to the seal of good housekeeping and SGLG back in the 90s, our province um, uh, was uh, uh, had enough foresight to invest heavily on GIS. So that means information gathering, mapping tools. Um, this has enabled us to plan fairly well and share this planning tool and implementation tool with our municipality. So, the GIS um, database proves very, very useful, especially to disaster management, um, health crisis management, um, pagbibigay ng ayuda, malaking, malaking tulong ang GIS. Next, please. Okay, so, um, we do not achieve uh, our targets alone. We have to admit that uh, everything we do is in collaboration with our partnership partners. So we build conservation partnerships in particular with, uh, uh, so, so that we can sustain a healthy ecosystem. You will see there COICA, um, which is the aid arm of uh, the Korean government, which has been our partner in livelihood in agriculture in, in many aspects. DNR is also a very strong partner in environmental management and in livelihood as well. Kasi pinag-join namin yung aming um, watershed protection. At the same time, since we are planting coffee trees, we are giving livelihood to, the, to our constituents residing in the mountainside. And then Department of Agriculture, for obvious reasons, have been a big help. And many NGOs have also participated in this effort. Next. Okay, number six um, is our adherence to the six strategies of sustainable development, namely governance, our transparent and uh, participatory governance. Um, number two is our capacity development or people empowerment. 
Uh, yung, yung number one, balikan ko lang, Sheila, it's, uh, it's very important to communicate um, the vision, the goals, even the projects to your people. Kung wala kang assets, kahit sa Facebook mo gawin, importante yung alam nila yung plano. So that in their own little way, if they want, they can participate and support the government. Number two, yung capacity development. Many of our LGUs, um, um, fifth class LGU, pero kahit na fifth class siya, uh, consistent SGLG award din siya. So we are helping them out because we want them also to, kasi kailangan din namin silang pumasa para pumasa rin kami, di ba? Obviously. But, but more than that, um, it's really a united effort. No? So minsan kasi you will see uh, fifth or sixth class municipalities uh, nahihirapan dun sa mga technical plans na sinabi ni Justine. It's precisely because um, it's harder for them to to procure or to hire uh, highly technical people. Di ba? Kasi uh, obviously mas bababa ang kanilang resource capacity. So dahil kakulangan ng tao at resource, duma, uh, lumalapit sila sa provincial government. And through our collaboration, we are able to help them and aid them in their um, compliance with all the plans and the requirements. Uh, number three is awareness or well-informed communities. Um, number four, infrastructure, climate-proof vital infrastructure is very important. So, hindi lang basta magtayo ng simpleng infrastructure. Dapat the good quality, the lasting infrastructure para hindi, para tumagal ang service to our people. And then uh, procurement of essential equipments, and then of course preventive measures, uh, especially in social services, in healthcare, and disaster management. Uh, next, okay. So uh, the performance challenge fund um, for us uh, for SGLG qualified LGUs has four four notable uh, features. So the Performance Challenge Fund, number one. Number two, the access to program windows of NGAs. Number three, continuing capacity development. And number four, access to loans. Those are the complementary features that help us in our efforts. Next. Okay, so on the results of the study, um, uh, two major points. No? Number one, the fifth and sixth class have the largest number of non-passers of the SGLG and that uh, repeated recipients come from, uh, more of them come from the first to fourth income classes. And number two, strong evidence in the research shows a direct correlation between municipalities' income level and likelihood of getting a PCF grant. Um, since SGLG criteria are anchored on a performance management system that focus on LGU capacity, uh, uh, to deliver basic services, uh, governance principles like transparency and accountability, and performance uh, like uh, accomplishment of plans, fund utilization, and frontline service delivery. These assessment criteria should not meant to be should not be meant to be too stringent requirements in order for one LGU to pass. Compliance with these criteria is the basic requirement for an LGU to ensure integrity and good performance through, through continuing go governance reform and sustained local development. In short, uh, an SGLG, LGU passer has a sustained development or ma-maintain sana itong kanyang uh, pagpas sa SGLG. Next. Um, okay, how did SGLG and PCF affect our people and, our, and, the, and the entire province? So in terms of financial administration, um, nag-improve ang transparency and accountability in using public funds. Of course, the mandatory posting of expenditures on websites, uh, the increased citizen participation in all government undertakings with the collaborative efforts of our interagency partners and civil society organizations, and the project monitoring committee uh, ensures standards in project implementation. So, malaking tulong din yung P PMC natin. The next, please. So in terms of disaster preparedness, it institutionalized the 24-7 uh, disaster preparedness of the provincial government. Um, nag, nagkaroon ng uh, 
major shift towards uh, investing more in disaster preparedness and giving a real full attention to the DRRM. And the province of Tilino, because of that, became a recipient of the National Gawad Kal Kalasag uh, just last year, um, which was primarily inspired by the SGLG. So next. In terms of social protection, it increased our responsiveness to the needs of the vulnerable and marginalized sectors in the society. Um, yung buildings namin naging uh, PWD friendly na, and we invested in halfway house uh, for the former rebels, Bahay Kanlungan, and also Bahay Silangan as a drug rehab center. So, nagkaroon din ng, ng appropriate investments. But I just like to say na dito sa social protection, very influential din siya sa aming management of the COVID crisis. And the principles that we follow help us um, maintain a COVID-free province so far. Next book. So, so in terms of peace and order, um, we implemented a no smoking policy and ban in the use of and ban in the use of plastic. So, um, dito sa Quirino, mas mahigpit kami kaysa sa buong Pilipinas, bawal ang single-use plastics dito. And then, secondly, we intensified implementation of peace and order programs to sustain peaceful and secured community. Uh, we collaborated more with the police and other uniformed uh, personnel. Um, Quirino has lately, uh, late last year, been declared as drug cleared. So, drug free province and yung buong six municipalities namin. And Team Embrace, which is the team that uh, rehabs our former drug users, was organized in 2018 to ensure that they are properly managed. Next. Okay, so in terms of business friendliness and competitiveness, um, our quite projects, such as the Quirino Integrated Agricultural Development Program um, and the Quirino Integrated Rural Development Program, <laughs> there's two mahaba kasi, um, were launched um, to really increase the competitiveness of our product. So, para siyang um, uh, processing facilities for, for food production. So, with the help of COICA, uh, we hope to produce export quality uh, grade products to be shipped out of our province into other countries. So the competitive uh, index ranks Canino at uh, 25, uh, I think, uh, so which is uh, increased already. The poverty index in the province was reduced from 20%. Uh, now down to 10%. So, so naging dramatic ang, sa, ang impact niya sa buhay na aming mga kababayan. Although, syempre, the COVID makes a different, uh, sto makes the story different today. Okay, next. In terms of environmental management, um, sanitary landfill is, all six municipalities have their sanitary landfills. Um, meron kaming tinatawag na zero waste management at uh, no plastic policy. Yan po yung sinabi ko kanina na walang uh, single-use plastics in the whole province. Um, we have a material recovery facility or MRFs placed in each LGU and some even in, in, in the barangays. And uh, collection segregation has become a practice of households, establishments, and entities in the province. Next. So yun po, um, siguro at this, on this note uh, to close, uh, nakalagay dyan, we will harness this unity and teamwork uh, and our efforts to build a better Kirino and a brighter future for our children. Siguro, let me just emphasize that um, this is not really just the effort of the province. It is really a un united effort. Uh, it, it comes as a whole of province approach, whole of Kirino approach. With the help of our municipal LGUs, the barangays, the national government agencies play the major role, and of course the private sector. So yun po, it's it's really a team effort that uh, that has sustained our performance in the SGLG. So thank you for your time, and I turn it back to you, Sheila.
Thank you very much, uh, Governor Dakila Kua. Um, we are uh, we appreciate very much uh, the um, your um, uh, sharing of your province's experience uh, in the PCF and uh, SGLG and the uh, various efforts that your uh, local uh, government has initiated in order to maintain your uh, very good performance. Friends, we are also uh, very privileged to have a well-known international expert on governance join us today, and I am referring to Dr. Louis Hawk of the World Bank. Uh, Luis has been based in Manila since uh, the early 2018 after four years as head of the Public Expenditure and Financial Accountability Secretariat, a global initiative for assessing and strengthening public financial management performance. He worked at the World Bank for more than a decade in uh, the US, in Europe, and in Central Asia. And prior to joining the bank, he was an independent uh, consultant supporting governments in the Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, and other Southeast Asian countries to strengthen their uh, public financial management arrangements. He was a senior ex uh, executive in the Australian Government Department of Finance and uh, UK Treasury for more than 20 years, where he contributed to leading edge developments such as accrual and performance budgeting, privatization, public agency governance, uh, service quality, integrated reporting, and public sector accountability. Here now is uh, Dr. Louis Hawk of the World Bank. Louis? Hi, Sheila. Thanks very much. Uh, it's uh, very interesting presentations from the uh, two previous speakers. Unfortunately, I don't have a presentation, but I do have a set that uh, on, the, on my comments that people can have access to if they want to. And I'll just, uh, I, I hopefully I won't take too long because I'm very interested in the discussion because we have so many uh, very uh, experienced and knowledgeable people online. And I think uh, that that will be the richest part of our uh, afternoon. So um, I guess the first thing I wanted to note is that this is uh, the, the work of the PIDS on um, local government is very interesting to the World Bank. Uh, it's uh, something we uh, activity on in the past in the Philippines, although we have done a few reports as uh, Justine mentioned. Um, and we are now involved in the in Mindanao quite heavily. But uh, I think uh, the the seal of good local governance and the performance challenge fund are very interesting because there are not many countries who have a, a similar um, approaches in other countries. There are lots of performance based grant programs, but not ones that are necessarily based on pre-qualification for good local governance. Uh, and that I think is one of the unique and interesting things about the Philippines that few other countries have in place. Uh, I think that the survey that was done by PIDS and the ILG is very interesting. And I'm sure just from the research that's been uh, published so far, there's a very rich database that people will be able to draw on both from the academic um, and uh, public sector areas, which I think will be very useful. Uh, and, I, and I think from uh, our perspective, from the World Bank perspective, having that good uh, basis for uh, analytics and uh, evaluation is very important. And I think that's probably one of the things that uh, one of the um, unmentioned benefits of having the uh, seal of good local governance is that it actually produces an enormous amount of useful data and uh, which can be used for policy making and for analysis. Um, I think one of the, the things that I found most interesting about uh, what Justine was talking about is that it shows uh, the uh, what, what's happened over the lifetime of this approach to improving governance and performance uh, in local government and what can happen if you change things like eligibility uh, conditions and the procedures for um, what uh, people have to perform to actually get access to the grants and also on the impact of having controls on the amount of money available if the number of uh, participants increases. Uh, I think one of the things that doesn't come through 
um, in the paper or in the presentation, although Justine uh, did mention that uh, that maybe the eligibility criteria is a factor. But uh, it would be very interesting if looking back on her slide 16 to understand what happened to those who were using the scheme in 2013 and 2017, but they didn't use it in 2014 and 2018, because that those two drop off points were quite crucial in terms of the, the coverage and effectiveness of the scheme. And I think uh, you could get quite a lot of uh, useful information by looking back uh, on, on not so much the people who were uh, successful, but the ones who either didn't apply or who weren't successful. I think the, one of the interesting things that uh, Justine focused on was the observation about the differential incidence across the regions and income levels. I think uh, this, uh, this is, it, it's, it's very useful information, but I guess it's, it's, pro it's problematic from a perspective because uh, if you're looking at equity, fairness, and uh, equality across the region, the kind of results that are coming through in terms of, you know, the greater success of the higher income regions and um, the consistent failure of some regions to qualify and, and even some who don't even know about the policy is a concern. And I think even, uh, especially after being in place for 10 years, this is something that uh, really needs um, closer attention to find out what are the reasons for, for these things? The cap on the program is interesting when you hear some of the responses from people saying that, uh, you know, it's uh, the amount of money is not worthwhile in terms of the effort they have to put in or the funds they get out of it or the difficulty in applying uh, for the funds. And um, for the sort of demand driven program you have, what you really want is for people to maintain motivation and incentive to continue to use the program, but if more people qualify, then less people get access. And I think that's something that really needs to be considered in the design of the program in the future. Should it be more uh, open-ended? Should it uh, change to maybe partial grants, partial loans? Uh, should there be um, more uh, targeting of the scheme? Those sorts of things uh, are aspects that, that uh, um, need to be considered in in implementing this new uh, SGLG law and also combining it uh, with the PCF. I think um, one of the things that shows up in the changes over time is it makes you think that perhaps the, the policy objectives of government have changed over the last 10 years because the eligibility criteria have changed. Maybe they've been tightened up to some extent. Um, especially in the move from the seal of good housekeeping to the seal of good local governance. But then the uh, very, the changes in the seal of local good governance to uh, how many hurdles have to be uh, cleared before people get access to the funds um, suggest that there, there is a much more complicated agenda at work there. And I think it would probably be, I haven't actually looked at the act, I have to say, the new law but it would be good for DILG and others to have a look at what it is they're actually trying to achieve with the SGLG and also what they're trying to achieve by com the combination uh, of the SGLG and the PCF. If, if uh, people are going to be eligible for both, um, what does that mean for the, uh, the management of the programs? and for the effectiveness of the programs. Does it dilute their effectiveness if they're both available? Would it be better to have just one, uh, which can maybe reduce the um, administration cost uh, overall and m maybe leave more money that could be used by the participants? Or can you combine the two schemes to, to achieve a couple of different objectives? Uh, and that's, that's certainly a possibility, particularly if you have objectives that are not easily aligned within a single program. So, for example, poverty reduction versus uh, capability and high performance. Those sorts of things tend to uh, go along different tracks, although very interesting uh, to hear from 
uh, Governor Chua, that um, that uh, you know some uh, some provinces are actually able to address both ends of the spectrum at the same time, and and the fact that they've been able to qualify for the scheme all the way along, I think, is quite impressive. But I don't think that's the common experience based on the data that um, that Justine was presenting. So I think uh, looking at the criteria, the the uh, the eligibility criteria and the criteria for funding would be uh, something uh, very important early on in the implementation of this new law. Um, one of the things that might be looked at is whether there should be more emphasis on what will be achieved in the future with funding uh, and how it will contribute to improvement of perhaps some of the less developed regions or the least capacity regions, rather than focusing on what's already been achieved. When you look at the eligibility criteria for the SGLG, it's about uh, already succeeded. And um, while that's an important thing to uh, encourage and to motivate and, and reward, I think uh, if you're looking for um, more balanced development across the country, then you also want to look out, look at the potential returns on investment. So, which areas might benefit most from the grants, and which ones might be the ones who will be uh, best um, uh, best affected, or where the people will be better off as a result of the funding. Uh, one thing that uh, Justine mentioned in the paper, but I don't know that she mentioned it today, is that. Uh, some of the the uh, validation wasn't actually um, completed for some some of the organisations, and I think one of the that kind that's uh, for me that's a bit of a, a red flag about how the evaluation of the program is being done. Um, although there's a lot of data on whether uh, the municipalities and provinces and cities. Uh, meet the objectives of the of the criteria. Are they actually what What's the value of the projects that they're implementing uh, with the funds that are available from the PCF, and in future what will be from the the new SGLG fund? Uh, I think that's an area that perhaps DILG might want to look at uh, in terms of the effectiveness of the program, not just on whether the money is uh, allocated, whether it's used, but how effective the projects are in achieving maybe other objectives like poverty reduction, uh, community development, employment growth, etc. And, and those sorts of things might be um, considered. And they also might be considered in terms of the objectives, going back to my previous question about what's this program really all about? Uh, and, and if you answer that, that uh, basic question, then that will help to uh, to guide the rest of the program. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention is that the, the, these programs are not um, uh, working in a vacuum. There are a lot of other things being done by DILG and other ministries, uh, other departments, at national departments, and also at the provincial and local level that are, uh, and are also obviously international development partners like Korea. Um, and the World Bank that, uh, that that are also need to be considered in the mix. And so, um, looking at SGLG and PCF in isolation uh, could be a bit misleading because you can look at say maybe maybe it's beneficial areas and less beneficial to others. But does it reinforce existing uh, disparities? Uh, in which case, what might result from these uh, these kind of programs is that they will actually reduce equality over time. I'm not saying that that's what uh, the, the PTF and the SDLG will do, but uh, if you look at some of the other programs, uh, they might not be complementary or they might not be fully those activities. Um, one of the things that I found interesting about uh, the uh, from, from the PIDS is that sometimes the PCF has been combined with other programs like the 4Ps program and disaster preparedness in uh, times when maybe the funds haven't been used fully 
for their original intended purpose. But uh, that's kind of been a one-off, and it's it seems a bit weird to me that the you know why did that happen? Why were they used for those purposes at that time? Was that part of the original intention that they should be filling the gaps in other programs, or is this just something that uh, was uh, sort of serendipitous because at the time there was extra money in DILG budget that that wasn't being fully utilised that could have been better used elsewhere. Um, also, I'm a bit concerned that there are other activities in other uh, uh, departments, uh, national departments, that haven't been linked. Um, I, can, I can remember in the DBM, for example, there's this really cool um, assessment toolbox for local governments, which was established in about 2012, which kind of aligns with the timing of the um, the good housekeeping and uh, good local governance uh, issues, but uh, but they don't seem to be aligned. The for example, the the financial management aspects of the PFM assessment toolkit are very detailed, uh, but quite different to the kind of criteria that are applying on financial management for the the uh, SELG and the the seal of good housekeeping and uh, I think it would be a good idea if there was a bit of a, a, a stop take of the existing programs that are relevant to the effectiveness of GILG's programs and to make sure that they were consistent across the board and that's not just with DBM but things like the health and education sectors as well and transport sectors um, but the other thing about these programs is that they all have their own eligibility criteria, their own reporting requirements and other obligations, which is an, an extra administrative burden for local governments, which are already stretched in terms of their administrative capability. And I think that's a holistic way. Um, so I think I probably will leave it there in terms of the comments on the overall uh, issues of this paper. But I think uh, one thing that Governor Kua was mentioning uh, that is kind of the elephant in the room uh, and mm -hmm. also that uh, Justine mentioned is another elephant bigger in the room are the implications of COVID-19 pandemic and the Supreme Court ruling on Mandanus versus Ochoa. Uh, and those two things, I think, have enormous implications for the effectiveness of these programs and also for the success of local government. Okay. And so that's it from me, and I'll, um, I'll hand back to you now. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Lewis. Um, okay, before we proceed uh, to the uh, open forum, um, I would like to get the, um, may we get the reaction, the response of uh, Dr. Sikat? to the comments of our discussions. And then later on, I will also ask um, our um, friends from the DILG, Director uh, Bonagua and our friends from uh, the DLGS to also give their uh, reactions to uh, the comments of, uh, particularly on the comments of, uh, of Lewis. Uh, Justine, please. So thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Lewis and Governor Kua for your responses, uh, very extensive. Uh, it's nice to hear about the collaboration, the, the, the strong collaboration among municipalities with the provincial government in uh, Quirino. This is one of the, actually one of the focus areas of our APPC conference in 2020, enhanced uh, collaboration across LGUs. Um, uh, I also noted that you, you indicated that it's the, the criteria should not meant to be too stringent to be able to maintain sustained uh, development. So, so that's also a very interesting because uh, uh, concept because we also received that feedback from the LGUs. Uh, at the same time, I think that's perhaps why it would be nice also to have differentiated uh, benchmarks or criteria across the different um, uh, components, core components of the SGLG moving forward. But this would be for the DILG to really consider how they would be be able to, to draft this. And it's nice to know that the seal of good local governance components have also sprouted programs within your province that that um, have been sustained 
uh, with regard to social protection, peace and order, and all this. Um, now for the congratulations on the reduction in poverty incidents as well. Now for Lewis's comments, uh, very much thank you for sharing also your, your comments with me ahead of time. I'd just like to focus perhaps on the on your discussion of uh, the importance to be able to, to match the objective of this moving forward of the SGLG uh, moving forward and it's design and incentivizing. I absolutely agree with you on that. That was also one of our recommendations that the SGLG must council must think, is it to award the best of the best or is it to, to address the, the concerns of those who never in fact won, not to leave any municipality behind. And once that objective becomes clear, it could be any combination, one or the other, or a combination of both. But once that is clear, that would also help try and design the, the incentive scheme um, and your suggestions regarding the, the different possible ways. Would it be more loans or would it be open-ended budgeting or would, would it be more targeted? That, that would be useful also for the SG and LG Council to, to think once the objective has been clear. I think the challenge in some of the programs that I have studied thus far um, is that sometimes the objectives um, in the programs are not as clear cut, so it's difficult to assess baseline and, and the results where, where it is right now. So, so I agree with you on that. The fundamental question must be answered and that should be able to guide how to incentivize, um, plus also balancing the extent of any targeted program we always have to think of an exit strategy or until when will there be handholding as well? Um, because we're also talking about limited resources um, when we talk about the budget. Um, now, for what was happened, uh, it's nice also that you mentioned the, in the slide 16. And I think Medina Gucci's article uh, or paper, I'm not sure if it's published yet, helps explain why there were sudden drops in 2018 and looks at it more extensively. So, she she said it was perhaps because of the change in the, the criteria that was used to assess the the local governments and it's expected uh, i think the dlgs could say more about this now the other comment on are the pcf sglg criteria appropriate we also have this comment and as i mentioned earlier it should be anchored on the purpose of the program so uh there should also be differentiated benchmarks for the various criteria that will be used. Now, with respect to, to the others, like the use of the PCF and its alignment, we said that it's not in a vacuum, it's SGLG and the PCF happens with all other programs, national government programs. And I think the DILG would be the best one to answer this, but um, some of the projects that they had identified that would be that the PCF fund could be used for uh, looks at MDGs and disaster risk reduction and environmental. So, so those are some of the um, more general programs of government that are allowed for under the use of the, the PCF. But I, I would leave this also to the DILG. Um, and I think uh, that's it. That's all I have to say, Sheena. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Justine. At this point, may I also uh, request uh, Director Anna Bonagua of our uh, DILG's Bureau of Local Government Development to comment on uh, some of the um, important issues uh, raised by, uh, by Louis, um, such as um, uh, the interaction between the SGLG and the PCF. It's, for him, it's, it's a bit unclear and there may be, uh, it, it's possibly overlapping. And uh, what is the um, uh, the objective of keeping both uh, programs? Because he said that uh, admit, uh, in terms of financial administration, it may be costly. And at the same time, if you could also comment probably on uh, what he said about the possible uh, impact of uh, uh, the Supreme Court ruling on uh, on 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 the on the PCF and uh, and the uh, and the SGLS, and also or let's say, does, it, does, does this mean that there should be greater oversight 
and uh, good governance uh, that should be expected uh, from our LGUs given the higher revenues that will be poured into the coffers of our LGUs. And then uh, should F SGLG and PCF be used, let's say, to allocate funds, priority funds for COVID-19 response. I will also ask uh, Governor Kuwa on this uh, um, issues later on. Okay, Director Anna, please. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Uh, that's quite a lot of questions. Well, first of all, our, um, uh, it's too well, well, I think at the moment, uh, the Philippines is one among the first uh, countries that have an incentive program for local government units. And we would like to thank World Bank because World Bank uh, helped us in developing the initial concept and the implementing rules uh, for the implementation of the PCF way back in 2010. Um, uh, there are a lot of things to consider in the drafting of the concept of uh, and implementing rules of the performance sharing fund as well as the seal of good local governance. Well, these two programs, these are twin programs of the DILG on performance management and incentive system. So we call it twin program, seal of good local governance and the performance challenge fund. Um, uh, the, per, the seal of good local governance is supposed to conduct the assessment of the performance of local government units, while the performance challenge fund is the one giving the incentives and the rewards, monetary and the other uh, uh, associated benefits for passing the seal of good local governance. So uh, uh, it's a continuum uh, from the performance assessment under the seal of good local governance to incentive systems under the performance challenge fund. Um, there are a lot of um, consideration in drafting the concepts and the implementing rules. For example, how how we can incentivize whether we incentivize, um, whether the incentives are commensurate with the required performance. Uh, but then we are limited by a fixed budget, regardless of the number of passers. So these okay. are the, the, that justifies the current rules and regulation. Uh, in terms of um, uh, it's the impact of the implementation of the Supreme Court ruling on the Bandana's uh, petition uh, and increasing the internal revenue allotment of local government units, well, uh, I think that will be good news for many of our, for all, I think, for all local government units. They have been waiting for this for the longest time. They will have greater resources to implement programs and projects. Um, uh, for devolved uh, activities and responsibilities of local government units. And I think um, even with increased resources, uh, the seal of good local governance and the performance challenge fund will be, will continuous, will continuous, sorry, should continuously uh, exist uh, in view of the new law, which is RA 11292, which institutionalizes the seal of good local governance, as well as even the incentive system, which will now be called the seal of good local governance incentive uh, fund. Um, while there will be more resources uh, to be given to local government units, so we will be expecting better performance from our local government units. And, and in saying that, of course, we will not end at that. Uh, the DILG will continuously raise the bar of performance because okay. of other, other mandates being given to local government units that needs to be assessed and uh, measured. So just in case uh, during this time of pandemic, there are a lot of um, uh, mandates and uh, given to local government units in order for them to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, I think uh, there are uh, already talks of including a new section maybe just temporary for uh, measuring local government response to COVID-19 to be part of the seal of good local governance. So the, 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 uh, the seal of good local governance and even the performance challenge fund, the areas were in, uh, in which the performance challenge fund can be used and can fund projects are evolving depending on the need of the, okay. of the local government. So those are the things that I can share with you. Thank you, Sheila. Maraming salamat, uh, Director Anna. Incidentally, well, uh, magpa-plug na kami, no? Because on August 20, we will have a PIDS, another PIDS webinar, this time on uh, our, uh, the paper by PIDS uh, written by Dr. Chot Manasan on the um, SC ruling, no? So we will have a presentation on that. And we will invite you, uh, Director Anna, as one of the discussants. Okay, so watch out for, for that webinar of ours on August 20. Um, Governor Kuwa, would you have um, any reaction uh, sa mga sinabi ni, ano, ni uh, 
uh, Louis, no? um, such as uh, you, um, for you as a local chief executive, uh, given this, uh, if, if because when the Mandana's ruling um, will be implemented, there will be greater revenues pouring into, you know, LGU. So does this mean for you, okay, Lamba, greater oversight, more good governance expected from LGUs like you, like uh, the Carino province, considering that there is more money flow that will be flowing into your coffers. And uh, should SGLG and PCF be used to allocate priority funds for COVID response? What do you think of this? Uh, Sir? Thank you, Sheila. Um, first, I'd like to react to to what uh, Mr. Hawk or Lewis uh, mentioned. Um, uh, I am very impressed by his uh, observations. It's it's as if he has lived in the Philippines for twenty years. <laughs> so very it's very insightful. Um, but uh, yeah, um, that Mandana's ruling is uh, is a welcome. Uh, development shall it be implemented in the near future? Obviously, uh, we expect, as per my crude calculations, about 20 to 30 percent increase in local revenues. No, um, but but Siguro, uh, this is off topic a little bit, but I'd like to point out that, um, that, uh, um, for us in the province of Quirino, we are trying to be as independent of ERA or national downloaded revenues as possible. Um, that's that's our objective, to be as independent of it as possible. Because um, for us to really be progressive, we have to have um, our own source of income. Ang problema ang tingin ko sa local code, uh, hindi gaano malawak ang room ng uh, provincial level at least ha, in uh, creating revenues. Um, mm -hmm. While the municipal and city levels have their business taxes, so mm -hmm. when they invite more investors, it literally translates to more sales and business taxes. For us, real property is a different uh, animal altogether. You know? it, it grows in a different way. Property values have to go up before, before real property taxes increase. And again, it's shared among three levels of LGUs. So it's it's a different structure. So that's a totally different uh, discussion. But but it points out to the fact that um, um, that is a constant struggle of LGUs. Na mm -hmm. maging independent of ERA. Yes, we welcome it. We we'd be very thankful and happy if it's implemented sooner than later. Uh, it will help us dramatically in uh, funding many needs, but it doesn't solve our dependence on that revenue. Okay, so so that's an issue that's not it's a little off topic, but uh, but uh, it's uh, it's right along that uh, discussion. I'd also um, um, I, I I'd like to state lang that um, um, the issue about uh, COVID nineteen is a multidimensional. I think more than um, many people don't realize that it's more than just health. Um, and economy, it cuts across many things. No? It cuts across environment, cuts across education. Obviously, ang hirap mag-aral o magpapunta ng bata sa school, infrastructure, uh, logistics, um, etc. Uh, and that that uh, weighs a heavy burden on our finances, on the LGUs. And um, and uh, and and I'd like to react to what. Louis said earlier that um, perhaps, uh, don't get me wrong, huh? uh, Director Anna is here and uh, I fully appreciate what SGLG has done, how it's uh, driven LGUs to strive to reach that seal, and it's really revolutionary. But then again, perhaps there is always room for improvement, and one of which is mentioned by Louis, or perhaps attaching it to loftier loftier results like uh, poverty reduction maybe quality yeah. of time mm -hmm. uh, increasing yeah. competency of our students in terms of education right. um, uh, provision of basic utilities like water electricity uh, things like that um, ac access to basic ut utilities so maybe as we measure these performance standards 
uh, included in this uh, SGLG parameters, let's tie them up. Because for 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 executives and local officials, it also means uh, a quick translation na mas maginhawa ang buhay sa ating provincia okay. or sa ating municipio, which means uh, it's something you can use also in the electoral process. Na okay. Yeah. Higher standard of living in our municipality, therefore, it resonates with the residents. So there, there is a political dimension, which is not necessarily wrong. Well, we harness it okay. for the context. So yun mm. lang po uh, a little bit of food for thought. Thank you very much, uh, Governor Kua. So as you said, we should scratch beyond the surface, no? So. Yeah, uh, probably deepen the criteria so that we're not just uh, looking at, you know. Uh, presence or absence of, but really outcomes and, and impacts. Uh, yeah. So, para mas ano, mas ma measure pa natin talaga yung, yung results ng, ng, uh, ng, ng, prog ng programa and if it is really uh, benefiting the people. Okay. Uh, right. So, at this point, um, before we entertain questions, uh, let us have a poll. And this is your chance to be heard para po sa ating mga, sa mga nanonood sa atin sa Facebook and uh, participants po sa WebEx. So in Dr. Sika's presentation, if, and if you are listening intently to uh, her recommendations, one of the suggestions that she mentioned was having uh, different criteria or different benchmarks according to the LGU's income class or regional location. So do you agree with this? Okay, so join our poll on the question for the SGLG. Should should there be different criteria or benchmarks according to LGU income class or regional location? Okay, so yes or no, we will reveal the results of this poll before the end of the webinar. Okay, so friends, we are now ready to entertain your questions. And I can see in our chat box that we have uh, some very interesting um uh, questions from um, our uh, WebEx uh, participants, and later on, we will go to our face uh, questions of our viewers on Facebook. And uh, for our open forum, aside from Dr. Sikat, Governor Kua, and uh, Lewis Hawk, we will we will be joined by uh, Director Anna Bonagua of the Bureau of Local Government Development, or BLGD, which is implementing the Performance Challenge Fund, or PCF. Ms. Edna Aragon. Uh, Division Chief and Ms. Melanie Kiton, focal person of the SGLG. Ms. Aragon and Ms. Kiton are from the Bureau of Local Government Supervision, lead, lead implementing uh, unit, lead implementer of the SGLG. So, welcome everyone to our open forum. And uh, for our first um, question, okay, and, and if, if I may uh, throw this to our uh, uh, friends from the DILG, uh, okay. And uh, this one is from Corinne Canlas. And she said, Kirino shows that having limited income or being in the poor category is not a deterrent to go good governance. The study indicates, though, that this is the limitation of low income class municipalities. So, and sabi niya, maybe a ladderized incentive system that could combine incentives plus on time. Capacity building. Director Anna, um, would you like to comment on this? Um, well, that's really the intention of the Seal of Good Local Governance and the Performance Challenge Fund. Uh, uh, the, the, the seal should be able to direct uh, local government units and even the ILG to interventions wherein local government units are in the weak. There. So uh, it is not just the incentive, which is the monetary incentive. <laughs> really lead uh, the DILG and even other national government agency to direct their capacity building intervention to the weakest areas of local government units or where they did not pass. Um, and uh, um, in the performance challenge fund, though there are a menu of uh, thematic areas where they can use, they can use this in, in so many other activities, including their own capacity building. So uh, I think uh, the, the LGs have the flexibility of using the uh, their uh, monetary incentive to where uh, it is most needed 
and uh, the sale of good local governance results will be able to direct national government agencies, the ILG and the other sectoral agency to uh, direct their assistance and capacity building intervention to the weakest areas of the local government units based on the results of the SGLG. Thank you very much, Dirk. Okay. Hello. Thank you very much, Director Anna. Um, our next question is again for uh, for the DILG, and this one is from Matthew Anosa, and he said, uh, "We understand that the Good Local Governance Council shared by the DILG formulates the IRR of the SGLG Act of 2019 or Republic Act 11292. May we know the update of the IRR since it's almost 11 months now since this law took effect and the IR." and the implementing rules and regulations have not been issued yet. Director Anna, any update on this? Well, uh, maybe we, the LGS can give more some uh, yes. data, but then yes. uh, uh, the council has been um, organized or convened. Uh, they have several mm -hmm. meetings towards uh, the finalization of the IRR. I think in the next few months or within the month or in the next month, uh, we will probably might be releasing the IRR, but then Melanie can give us the yes. Uh, post, Thank you. Uh, the dates. Uh, Melanie, hello. Hi, good Hi, afternoon. Yes, could, could you uh, please uh, turn on your uh, video so we can see yeah, you? Here I am now. Yes. <laughs> um. Yeah. Regarding the IRR, actually, we are now in the process of finalizing. Um. Actually, we are integrating several inputs from um our uh, fellow council members and uh, we are now finished with the third draft we are already working on the third, fourth draft of the irr so hopefully before the quarter ends this will be um, approved then um, disseminated to all okay thank you very much melanie okay okay um and for our next question, uh, we have this one is again. Okay. Okay. May we hear uh, Governor Skuwa's response on this question, sir? And this is from Veronica Hitosis of the League of Cities of the Philippines. Uh, perhaps um, Justin first, and then I will go to, doc uh, to uh, Governor Kuwa. Okay, does the research uh, take into consideration the profile of LCEs in the top performing and laggard LGUs? Why or why not? Uh, because he, she said it is noticeable that for cities, most SGLG awardees have minimal or no change at all in the LCEs. I'll, I'll get uh, Governor Cohen's uh, um, insight on this later on. But Justine? Thank you for that question, Ms. Tosses. I think if I'm, my memory serves me right, she was a former student of mine. So <laughs> in any case, yeah, yeah. Uh, nice to hear from you. Um, no, this study does not, uh, but we do have the data and we will be working on it sometime in the future. So thank you. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Governor Kwame also uh I get your insights on this as president of uh, the national president of ULAP of the Union of Local Authorities in the Philippines. So is this justified? He said that most awardees have minimal or no change at all in the LCEs. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> mahirap din tanong niya. Uh, very good question, ma'am. And uh, um, I, I, it's not, I think kasi the SGLG is not, um, parang hindi the same context for all, eh, for all. Um, but, but yeah, um, uh, you, I, I think that, um, the point may be, does continuity of leadership mm -hmm. help? In, yeah. Is it a factor, ba? What do you, uh, yeah. is in, it a, in, yeah? It will again depend on the leadership. If that yeah. if LCE is driven to achieve it, then yes. If the LCE doesn't really care about it, then maybe not. So, uh, walang one answer for all. But uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, mm -hmm. technically it could be a positive effect. I I can see how it can be uh, helpful to the maintenance of the SGLG. 
Thank you very much, Governor. Uh, we have an um, we have this question for you again, and uh, well, you already mentioned your thoughts about the bandanas, but let me just uh, uh, read this question for Go Governor Kua. How are you preparing to scale up responsibilities and resources once bandanas is implemented? Do you foresee any challenge in terms of capacity constraint? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I, I have yet to see or listen to what the national government will be downloading. I heard, I heard that um, national government intends to, to offload some expenditures, some responsibilities and functions to LGUs, um, and only upon seeing that list or that mechanism will we be able to analyze if we are prepared for it or not, right? But, but ako, uh, okay, I welcome the challenge. I welcome more responsibility. It will mean more, um, uh, more intervention at the grassroots level, at the LGU level. I mean, para uh, targeted. For example, um, if if let's say a, a good percentage of agri agriculture funds are downloaded directly to LGUs, edi mas um, mas uh, targeted yung programs to the needs of the farmers hindi yung national uh, hagip na lang lahat na program di ba so but I, I do agree there should be programs that should be national in scope but but yeah i welcome it and uh, i guess that what we are trying to do is really to gather more data from the ground as to prepare for what programs we will be implementing grant uh, when the grant comes when the when the additional funds come Thank you, Governor. This uh, next question is for um, Justine. I think this was covered by your study, no? Yung uh, SGLG has it influenced the formulation of the mission, vision, and development strategies of participating LGUs for passers as well as for non-passers. And I think you you got a favorable uh, response on this. Okay. Although to what extent we we don't know, right? Kahit Shira, I, uh, um, thank you. I think it's Tony Avila for that question. Hi, Tony. Um, yeah, the the evidence we got is that 78% of the municipalities claim that the SGLG has influenced the the vision, goals, and policy. 8.4% claim that it has already been aligned. Their vision has already been aligned with SGLG priorities, while 8.6% said that. Um, the LGU has other priorities than those identified in the criteria of SGLG. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, may I uh, throw this next question to Melanie? Uh, and this one is from Arnold Rowan Pita. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, Melanie? Uh, is it possible that we also incentivize through the SGLG, the LGUs that continue to show decreased reliance on the ERA? Regardless of the Mandana's ruling, just like what Corino province is trying to do, uh, evidenced by increase in locally sourced revenues. What do you think? Uh, yes, your microphone is on now. Hello? Okay. Melanie? Um, yes, and I... Maybe um this could be made into a criteria in the SGLG. Um but uh but to so but uh to make it as a sole uh sole criteria like a different award would be a different thing. It can be integrated um into um into uh, the financial admin maybe of the SGLG, then um studied, then we'll see if um uh, uh, studied by the technical working group, and we'll see if um, there is uh, a number of really LGUs that. Melanie, uh, your microphone is uh, off. We cannot hear you. Hello? Hello? Melanie? Okay, well, well, I think Melanie is having some problems with her connection, but let's go to another question. And this time, this is from, uh, okay. 
it's it's comment from uh, David Alunidis uh, Yap, uh, Dr. Yap of uh, UP of uh, University of the Philippines, uh, DTI CM CMCI groups. Okay, for ex uh, DTI's uh, CMCI groups, LGUs by specific categories. For example, you cannot compare competitiveness among highly urbanized cities. First to third class municipalities and four to six class municipalities. Thus, for the SGLG, LGUs should be grouped. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Uh. Okay, let's go to um, okay. Let's let's go to um to the criteria current uh present criteria of the SGLG and as we can uh, observe, they put premium on certain governance principles such as transparency, accountability, and participation. How about the principle of let's say innovation or innovativeness, which is an important trait that our LG should uh, demonstrate because we have smart successful LGUs that are using uh, current technology to streamline their operations, create efficiencies, and uh, let's say produce better results with no additional resources. Uh, what do you think of this, uh, Charlotte, uh, Justine, and, and uh, Governor Kuwa? We think there is a need to revisit the, uh, the criteria and, you know, incorporate other important um, governance uh, principles aside from the ones that we have now. Justine? Hi, thanks. That's that's an interesting question that you posed there. There would be eventually, I think, a need to, to consider other criteria, which is what has been done through the past nine years of this implementation. The SGLG would add, add additional criteria, but I would like to focus also on the existing uh, criteria and benchmarks and how to improve their definition, especially with the um, forthcoming shift to the SGLG incentive fund as well. So, so I would like, I'm more, I'm always, you know, erring on the side of caution. Let's examine first what the criteria is now. How does it exactly evaluate? How can it be improved? And then eventually, yes, gradually, it, uh, we will be adding on the criteria. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, Governor Kua, what are your thoughts on this? Adding, let's say, a, a, um, a criteria uh, relating to uh, innovation, innovativeness. Uh, that's something that you really, you know, uh, local governments should be uh, demonstrating, especially at this time when we are in the new normal. Can I copy the answer of Mam Sikat? Okay. <laughs> what I mean is, um, uh, what I mean is, can we leave it to the experts? But but I would uh, recommend to listen to to have that uh, feedback mechanism so the LGUs can propose new criteria, so that yes. the experts can evaluate if it's measurable, if it can mm -hmm. be targeted, or yes. you know can be a clearly cut uh, idea. But mm -hmm. but yeah, uh, I guess that is one area that LGUs should uh, strive for: young innovation and thinking out of the box. Yes. Director Happy Anna, any thoughts? <laughs> Director Anna, any thoughts on this? Uh, you know, revisiting the criteria and having uh, you know, additional criteria or streamlining if really too much other than no? Um, yes, Sheila. Um oh, the question is very good. Um right right now under the law, uh there are already uh, identified uh, thematic area for the assessment of the sale of good local governance. And uh I think for innovation, if it's it, it can areas and then uh, as I mentioned um, the indicators continues to change and evolve through the years so the indicator last 10 years been evolving every year we have continuously added new indicators uh, based on the new requirements for local government needs uh, I think the question is about um, um, clustering them for example in the in the CMCI there's a cluster for highly urbanized cities component cities and 
even uh, independent component cities. And then for municipalities, there's a cluster for first to third class municipalities and fourth to sixth class municipalities. I think that could be done also for the sale of good local governance. Uh, right now, our classification is just based on the province, cities, and municipalities. So there's distinction in the indicators being measured across the three levels. But probably later on, um, uh, we can explore categorizing them further uh, within the city, so from HUC to ICC to CC and to ICC and maybe for the municipality. So uh, we will look into this. Actually, this has, this has been explored uh, even in prior years, but then uh, um, in view of the volumity of the indicators, it's very hard for us yeah. to define because it's for the first class or so first to third class and which is one which was for the fourth to sixth class. But eventually we will get there. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Director Anna. We have a question here from one of our Facebook viewers, uh, Jose Marie Trinidad. Does the SGLG equate to the competitiveness ranking of an LGU? Uh na mentioned in Kanina the Dr. David yep, uh, from UP yung uh, competitiveness uh, ranking. So, ano ba yung ano doon? Does it, you know, equate to that? Uh, meron bang relasyon sila? Director Anna? Um, well, competitive ranking is uh, on is one of the indicators of the sale of good local governance. So under that indicator of business friendliness and competitiveness, uh, the ranking of the local government units in the CMCI results is part of the indicator. So it's being covered and integrated under the business friendliness of local governance. So when, like, like for example, if they are uh, they 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 are one of the top fifty. Uh, competitiveness, competitive LGUs, they they um, automatically pass that particular uh, indicator. So that, that is how the measurement systems of the other national government agencies. Thank you very much, Director Anna. Okay. Um, hmm. uh, this is a bit a well. Medyo controversial itong question ni uh, Jovel Castillo. What can you say about some LGUs who receive SGLG then after have a kiss from the ombudsman? <laughs> you, you don't have to answer that, sir. Okay. Um, from Alvin Amil, the last update of the income classification was during 2008. How will this affect the SGLG should there be different criteria across income class levels? So yeah, uh, we'd like to relate this to our poll, just in case, no, just in case, na, uh, we will have, we will come up with a differentiated criteria, you know, um, depending or according to um, LGU income classification. So, Justine, any thoughts on this, or should I ask our friends from the DILG? Yeah, thank you, Sheila. Well, I was really reading the question. Then, uh, how will this affect the SGLG? Should there be different criteria different criteria across, across income, income class levels? levels? Well, actually, that was one of the um, that could be one of the included recommendations of mine. I said there should be differentiated across um, perhaps income class of LGUs, but this depends. I know also as a fact that there was a bill already wanting to uh, amend the LGU income classification, the redefinition of the LGU income classification a couple of years back. But, but I guess we can also ask um, the, S, uh, the BLGS actually, uh, if Ms. Susan or Ms. Um, Aragon could also answer this. Thank you. Okay, Mamedna or um, Car Car no, not Carmen. Ma'am Edna or okay, nawala na si ano. Nawala na siya. Ma'am Edna, would you like to comment on this? Oh, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, the income classification of LGUs falls with uh, the Department of Finance. So, yung last oh, uh, at the moment, yung SGLG, wala namang income classification, wala namang classification ng LGUs. They all apply yes. to all. Yes. And it's an um, um, applic 
ang ginagamit is yung all-in criteria, no? So, the criteria should be applicable to, to all LGUs. Okay. Uh -oh. We can park that question for now. And, uh, you know, go back to it once we have this, uh, supposing there will be a change in the um, implementation of uh, the SGLG. Next, this next question is from Dennis Devera of LGU Talavera. And, uh, okay, and he said LGU classifications from first to sixth class suggest already inherent inequalities in both background capability and potential capacity performance, don't you think that assessing them based on current governance assessment report is a bit unreasonable? It assumes that they have the same initial condition. Given six different classes, why not design a governance assessment report based on their classifications? Uh, Director Anna, what do you think of this? Uh, okay. Uh, well, well, that's one thing that we that, that limit us in uh, categorizing or clustering the local government units. As mentioned, uh, uh, our income class classification dates back 2008, and uh, in that classification, based on the income brackets, um, at least I think uh, 80 to 90 percent of all local government units falls under the first class income classification. So, um, so that actually limits us in. Um, in 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 doing a income based um, uh, criteria for the seal of good local governance, but then I think we'll 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 probably get there as soon as maybe the the law or the 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 law for the income classification is passed and the income classification is uh, has been updated in such a way that it will be equally distributed uh, across or the income levels has been updated so that uh, not all LGs will fall under the first as it's it right now um it's been the dil just been exploring that uh mechanism but uh maybe not in the near future or unless the income classification bill has been passed okay thank you very much uh director anna miss edna would you like to add something or any thoughts uh justine would you have anything to say uh Robert, at the income classification as part of the regularization of LGUs, but not at the moment. Uh, I prefer the CGLG. Okay, thank you, Ma'am uh, Edna. Uh, Justine, if I may um, address this next question to you, it's from one of our Facebook viewers. Jimmy Marifoske. Sabi niya, in the baseline study on fiscal and governance gaps, and he's referring to your presentation uh, two weeks ago, only 5.1% have valid uh, CLUPs, 4.4% have valid CDPs, and 31.2% have valid LDIPs. Only 464 LGUs received SGLG in 2017 and 263 in 2018, despite only 64 LGUs having valid CLUPs. What could be the pros and cons of considering valid CLUPs, CDPs, and LDIPs as requirements for the SGLG? The figures regarding the results of the updated uh, plans are correct. Um, let me try to understand the question. So he's asking if this is going to be used as criteria. Actually, um, the presence of a plan is used as part partial criteria when it comes to good financial housekeeping for the SGLG, although I think the BLGS would be able to better answer this. So um, if you take a look at it, so I'm looking at the guidelines for the implementation of the SGLG. It would in be incorporated in the financing development um, financial administration criteria. And that would be functional municipal development council, which includes the uh, criteria of approved LD, uh, LDIP, CDP, and AIP. So it is actually already part of the criteria. But I think the value added of our study was that we looked in particular at the coverage of the each of the plans uh, based on the day, the year that we had surveyed. So our our year of reckoning was 2018. And what we looked at is if the CLUP was valid plus or minus eight years, 
if the CDP was valid plus plus or minus five years, if the LDIP was valid plus or minus um, three year, two years, then that is considered as updated. But again, um, even if let's say in the case of the CDP, 45% said that I we found that only 45% were updated. About almost 90% said that they had. So I think that's the difference. You can claim that you have, and that would make the the grade that would be a pass. But if what we did was we looked at the period of validity in order to be able to say if the plans were updated or not. So I think that's one area that the SGLG Council should also consider with regard to that. It's not just the presence of, but if it is updated. So thank you. Yeah, definitely it's important to have updated plans, <laughs> Christine. Okay, uh, if I may uh, throw this next question to uh, Ma'am Edna of the uh, of the LGS, no, because one of the uh, things that uh, Justine reported in the study is inadequate information that uh, is, is the perception of uh, the LGUs that the PCF applies only to low um, low income class. Yeah, the the, the poor municip uh, that the PCF does not apply to the poor municipalities, and and we can attribute this probably to you know mostly to um, the fact that because only a few of them really uh, qualify for the PCF, hence that perception. So another reason is the inadequate information that this LGUs have, uh, owing perhaps to limited information dissemination. So, Ma'am Edna, how does the DILG address this uh, information, um, inadequate information that our LGUs receive about the PCF? What actions have the department or, let's say, in particular, the BLGS uh, have done to address this uh, issue. Um, Mom, I don't think there's an inadequacy of information dissemination. Mm -hmm. uh, probably, uh, probably uh, uh, those falling within the fifth or sixth class, uh, sixth class income uh, failed to pass. Because of the required uh, means of verification, verifiable documents. Uh, but I think uh, we have enough uh, staff from the central to the regional to the provincial level for them to disseminate information about SGLT implementation. Okay, everybody, thank you very Yeah, everybody is being. Uh, every step of the implementation. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Edna. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, Governor Kua, um, you are the national president of the Union of Local Authorities of the Philippines or ULAP, no? So have there been any capacity building activities that may mga uh, capacity building activities ba na ginagawa ang, ang ULAP to our LGUs to let's say make them more effective and efficient in performing their their, their functions and in the process para yung mga uh, lagard municipalities naman ay maka uh, maka ano maka qualify for the seal of good local governance or and, and the, the PCF as well may mga ganung mga activities ang ulap um yeah uh sila i i believe that um Yung mga activities na yan, uh, meron, no? meron, firstly. But uh, most of them are, are local government uh, academy, DILG led. Mm -hmm. no? And mm -hmm. then sometimes they co collaborate with our members, which are the League of Provinces, League of Cities, League of Municipalities, that uh, work hand in hand with LGA. And in general, when there's a general forum, the ULA participates as well. So, okay. yes, there they are, but most of them are they are LG and um, uh, LGA led. But but that's a good point, and uh, and uh, we will collaborate tighter with the DILG and uh, and gather that data and uh, try to come up with top dev efforts. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we have a question here from Malen Gray. Any opinion or thought? Any opinions or thoughts why some LGUs were either just one time 
or not consistent recipients of SGLG. Any thoughts on this? So, so hindi niya lalas sustain yung uh, pagiging SGLG pastor nila or a uh, PCF recipient. Um, Governor Kuwa? Bakit see, kaya? May... Si Justine is be better to better give to answer she has the data. I apologize. Uh, Justine, but... Justine, any thoughts? Bakit yung iba one time lang? Uh, hindi sila consistent, pero yung iba naman... Well, kanina sinabi nga ni uh, Governor Kuwa, it all boils down to leadership. So, it's not not just, you know, na napakita naman na even the fourth for class municipalities ano uh, yung iba twice nag ano naka ng SGLG yes just think yeah Chila. exactly uh, that, uh, go okay, ahead sir. is fifth class pero consistent 2014 to 2018 ah, okay fifth class fifth, opo fifth, <laughs> sorry about that okay not, not the province are municipal okay thank you sir uh Justine yeah absolutely Sheila. that's a that's a good point you raised um it's not really because of the, uh, you know, there's governance also to it. It's not just because of the requirements. But then, as I mentioned earlier, there was another study that that really examined the dip in in uh, the recipients for years where the assessment criteria changed. So that's also another factor. If it was a period where you shifted from three plus one to four plus one or to to all in, that could be part of the reason as well. But clearly, income class um, may not be a stronger reason because there are fourth income class municipalities I showed you I showed earlier that were repeat recipients of SGLG. Uh, but again, also there's the governance issue. Also, um, we know that um, the local chief executive uh, may change every three years, so it really depends. Uh, so there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mom Anna, if I may get your comment on this, uh, there is an interesting uh, um, insight from R.A. Lorca, one of our Facebook viewers. Sabi niya, there, there may be a need to harmonize the indicators of the CMCI with the C SGLG criteria to reduce the admin burden of LGUs, especially the admin requirements that should be complied for the different performance measures. What do you think, Paul? Um, yeah, we thank you for the question. We do agree. Uh, there are a lot of uh, measurement system being implemented and local government units are being asked to submit a lot of information and data for the assessment. Um, uh, we will be working on this, but right now uh, we can say that there's already harmonization of uh, um, the measurement system for most local government units. I think, uh, as I said earlier, uh, the CNCI or the competitiveness index um, indicators are already embedded in the state of good local governance. So once an LGU pass or uh, are part of the top 50 com most competitiveness, uh, most competitive cities or municipalities, they automatically pass a criteria uh, which is the business friendliness and competitiveness under the seal of good local governance so we don't so that we don't have to repeat the indicators under the seal of good local governance so we just um um take on or incorporate the other measurement system of the other national government agency like the cmci child friendly lgu disaster preparedness and these are brought into the four as part of the indicators so we don't have to duplicate uh, uh the assessment for local government units Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Ma'am Anna. It appears that we have uh, already uh, entertained all our questions from uh, our uh, WebEx participants and uh, the relevant questions from our Facebook viewers. So at this point, may I um, request some brief, uh, you know, remarks from our uh, panelists, starting off with uh, Justine and then Governor Kuwa. Uh, May we hear from uh, Louis again, Director An and Director Anna. Justine? Yes. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Yeah. I think this is a very opportune time that um, it was the, with Director Anna that we had conceptualized adding this study to the baseline study of, um, of the Local Government Support Fund Assistance to Municipalities Program. So it's a very opportune time to take, to consider these results, especially since the IRR is now going to be uh, is being drafted the fourth version so i hope that and i know that um, all of these will be considered as well thank you and i also wanted to mention that 
uh, I forgot to mention this last time, but all local government units will be given uh, hard copies of the, the reports um, as part of our dissemination exercise. So they can look forward to, to that as well, because I saw that a lot were asked for the presentation. You will also be getting hard copies of results once I guess they can be shipped safely. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Governor, any last thoughts, final remarks from you? Siguro, uh, Sheila, um, magpasalamat lang ako sa ating team, yung SGLG team, headed by Director Anna. Of course, uh, with, with the participation of um, uh, Ms. Justine Sikat and and all who, who continuously um, uh, set the standards for LGUs, um, we welcome this. We appreciate this very much, uh, and we appreciate that um, you are helping us. Um, yun lang, uh, uh, good work po, and uh, we'd like to thank you in behalf of all the LGUs. Thank you very much, Governor Kua. Hi, Louis. May we hear from you again in case you have any uh, final uh, remarks? It's, uh, it's been a very interesting discussion. Um, it's, uh, and I look forward to hearing the, the further uh, developments on the criteria and the implementation of the or completion of the IRR and uh, the uh, finalization of uh, of the the changes in any criteria that might happen with these programs and uh from the world bank's point of view uh we uh, we tend to take a a, a broader approach and uh, we look forward to being involved in the discussions on uh some of the other issues i mean we're already uh, providing support on the issues around the um uh, 19 impact but uh i think also on the the Mandanas ruling, we have a very strong interest in in how that's going to affect the economy generally, but also the allocation of resources. Um, but I think the, the issues that uh, the PIDS are looking at in these series of papers on local government are extremely important, and I I, uh, I really appreciate we really appreciate the work that uh, they're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louis. Hi, uh, Director Anna, would you like to say uh, a few words or would you like to uh, see them later for your closing? Hey, you, Paul. Um, Sheila, maybe I'll reserve my uh, comments during the closing. Thank you. Thank you. And from uh, the BLGS, Miss um, Edna, any last words, Paul? Um, Edna? And uh, maybe in two months' time, we We'll be able to come up with the IRR for the LG. In time na wala pa yung assessment for the year, yun ang aming focus na yun. Salamat po. Salamat po, ma'am. Uh, yeah, that's very good news po. Okay, so uh, now let us go to the results of our poll on the question for the SGLG. Should there be different criteria or benchmarks according so LGU income class or regional location. When please show us the results. Seven seconds according to Gwen. Okay. We have res the results now. Okay. I I maybe Kushamakita. Okay. Uh, there were 205 uh, WebEx, WebEx participants that uh, responded to our poll, and most of them uh, said yes. So they are for a differentiated criteria um, and also benchmarks based on uh, the LGU's uh, income class and uh, regional location. So there you go. Yes, ang gusto, yes, ang gusto ng karamihan. Okay, friends, uh, huh? our discussion today has unpacked the issues surrounding the award incentive program for our local government. So aside from key findings such as the inability of many low-income uh, low municipalities to qualify in the program, which reflect the need to intensify capacity building activities for this LGUs, I think a critical insight for re re worth reflecting on is to deepen the criteria and consider other indicators no, that relate, let's say, to outcomes and impacts 
of the transparent and accountable use of public funds towards an LG's development. In, in other words, no, we should, you know, uh, scratch beyond the surface. No? And it's also important to ensure that our LGs do not become dependent on incentives and awards to motivate them to perform well and to step up their game. Without, with or without incentives, local governments should have the desire to give their best. And that is why it's also important that we elect local leaders who are competent and committed to public service. And as we have seen in today's presentation, there are fifth class municipalities that are able to qualify for the SGLG and the PCF, and we can attribute this to effective leadership effective leadership and governance. So please join me in thanking our resource speaker, Dr. Justine Sikat, our discussants, Governor Ku and Dr. Uh, Louis Hawk, and our partners from the, from the DALG, Director Ana Bonagua, Ms. Edna Aragon, and Ms. Uh, Melanie Kiton for, their ins for the insights that they shared with us this afternoon. Please uh, let us give them a big virtual clap. Okay, and thanks to all of you for your active participation. I now call on uh, the DGLD Director Ana Bonaga for her closing remarks, ma'am. Um, thank you, Sheila. Well, uh, as they say, some good things have to end. Um, on behalf of uh, the DILG Secretary Eduardo Emanuel, it is my honor and pleasure that to thank everyone for being part of this second of the three part DIDS and DILG webinar series on promoting good local governance in the Philippines. Uh, thank you to our speakers and panelists, uh, uh, Dr. Justin Jokno, Governor Dax, Sufina Nani Sikov Dax, uh, Dr. Lewis Hawk of uh, the World Bank, uh, for the findings and the valuable insight uh, into the active participation of our viewers through their questions, which made this webinar very informative and productive. Um, the study began as an offshoot uh, from the baseline on the existing gaps in the matter of governance policy, uh, project execution, and fiscal concerns at the local level. The DILG uh, would like to find uh, finds the need to assess whether uh, DILG performance management and incentive system uh, through the twin program Seal of Good Local Governance and uh, Performance Challenge Fund is achieving its program goal and objective and to get the sense uh, of the appreciation of the local governments with the goal in mind of continuously refining, uh, updating, redesign if needed, uh, the indicators and the implementing rules to make the program more relevant and effective tool in influencing the behavior of local governments and incentivizing performance towards attaining uh, you say a gold standard in, lo in local governance performance. Uh, almost a decade after it was uh, introduced in 2010, the PCF as a mechanism for improved local governance with an incentive program for the, which is an incentive program for the seal of good housekeeping then, uh, uh, with a pilot uh, allocation of only 30 million for 30 eligible LGUs, the PCF has continued to evolve uh, and have gained support with a stable allocation of 1 billion uh, a year starting from 2012 up to the moment. Uh, it's implementing guidelines for uh, the operation is being updated annually and even the indicators for the seal of, uh, in the assessment of the seal of good local governance are updated, upgraded, and uh, being raised in the highest bar of excellence for local government units. With the passage of RA 11292 or the institutionalization of the seal of good local governance, as an award, incentive, and honor and recognition based on uh, base program for local government units, uh, uh, the sale of good local governance will continue to exist and the PCF will now be institutionalized and will transition uh, to be now code or to be known as the sale of good local governance incentive fund starting 2021. We do not have the assessment of the sale of good local governance this year uh, 2020 in view of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, the DILG acknowledged the findings and the key recommendation of the study, as well as the insights uh, from our panelists, Governor Kuwa, who is representing the local governments, and advice uh, and uh, critical inputs from our expert from World Bank, uh, Mr. Lewis. And we will endeavor to integrate these results in our um, 
planning and uh, refinements of the concept and the implementing guidelines for both the sale of good local governance and the performance challenge fund. Uh, and in, in, in preparing the incentive packages for local government units, which should be at least commensurate to the level of efforts uh, that the LCU deliver in order to just reach that seal of good local governance. Uh, this is especially timely given that the, uh, well, the expected increase in the internal revenue allotment, uh, anticipating the implementation of the Supreme Court ruling on the Mandanas case, which would expand the fiscal capacities of our local government units, particularly in funding uh, local development projects and uh, improving the delivery, service delivery among the, their constituents. So we're expecting better performance from local government units in the future. Um, the results and findings of this study will definitely help the department implement a more responsive and competitive incentive package and for recognizing uh, good local governance performance, uh, including uh, the suggestions that we have heard today. Um, we hope that the report would also reach uh, other government agencies and also non-government organizations, even private sector and the academe, uh, so that all together we can help improve. Uh, we have a lot of stakeholders in the SGLG Council that we can help improve uh, the concepts, the indicators, and the implementing mechanism uh, for the seal of good local governance and the uh, performance challenge fund. Uh, we hope that the report, report findings, insights, and re reflections uh, shared today will help us um, push for the DILG's campaign uh, for good governance anchored on greater transparency, accountability, responsiveness, and people participation, which are all essential uh, elements of a good governance, of good governance. Uh, so, in ending, um, allow me to conclude by uh, extend, extending our sincerest gratitude and congratulations to all who made this event uh, possible and successful. Uh, the entire D PIDS family for the partnership and uh, the, whole, the support in the conduct of studies aimed at improving the programs and services of the DILG, Dr. Justin uh, Sikat, for always providing comprehensive results of the studies and giving us invaluable insights and recommendation. Uh, to Governor Dax, uh, talaga namin si Governor Dax for always been, being very active, uh, being the active voice of local government units in national policy discussions and to all the local government units present here today who uh, send their questions and also for striving hard in improving their services standard to pass the seal of good local governance and therefore benefit from the performance challenge fund. Uh, we also appreciate your, well, your sharing of your insights and your recommendation. Rest assured that we will consider this in the uh, drafting or finalizing the IRR and the implementing guidelines for both SGLC and the PCA. We acknowledge also the efforts of our DILC field offices in ensuring the smooth coordination to gather the data for the study and all the DILC viewers and offices for providing their insights and assistance. And of course, to our uh, SGLG, SLGP team for facilitating the conduct of the series of studies on promoting good local governance uh, in the Philippines. Uh, marami pong salamat. To everyone uh, who has made this activity possible, marami salamat kung di mong kuman na, na mention. On behalf, again, of the DILG Secretary, Secretary Anyo, I urge, um, we urge you, our local government units, uh, to continuously improve our service delivery performance to our constituents. Uh, Siyempre, tagline ng DILG para sa mapagkalinga, maunlad, at ligtas na pamahalang lokal. I hope uh, we, uh, we take away great learnings from this event to inspire our local governments as well as us in DILG to institute innovations in our respective localities and ensure improved services to our delivery and improve our programs for our local government units. So, good day and keep safe, everyone. Mabuhay po. Maraming salamat, Director Ana Buenagua. So, uh, just before we close, we have some reminders. So, uh, you can access the presentations from the PIDS website. Uh, the uh, link is uh, flashed on your screen. If you missed the link, we will also email it to you and do visit our Facebook page because um, we have uh, some interesting, other interesting uh, webinars um, coming up, in, coming up, such as the one on August 20 on uh, the PI, PIDS study on the SU ruling on the Mandanas petition.
Please also answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. We will also e email you the link after the webinar. Your comments and uh, suggestions are important to us to improve our webinars. And also please visit uh, our social media pages. Uh, we have a Twitter account as well. And of course, our website, which contains all knowledge resources uh, produced by uh, PIDS and uh, all the studies, uh, the presentations, uh, of the studies that we contact uh, that we contacted with the ILG, including um, the uh, presentation, the, the study uh, presented by Dr. Sika two weeks ago, that you can also uh, download the, the full copy from our website. And finally, we would like to acknowledge uh, the various organizations from government, academic, civil society, business, and international development community uh, that join us today. And you can see the names of those uh, offices on the screen. And of course. Again, our deepest acknowledgments to the DILG for partnering with us in this uh, webinar series. So we have, we still have uh, one webinar left, okay, which is the last of our three part webinar series and it will be on August 13 and it's about the community based uh, management system or the CBMS. Okay, and next week on August 6, we'll talk about another interesting topic, which is uh, a PIDS study on small scale mining in the Philippines. So we do hope you can join us again. So friends, this ends our webinar for this week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed. Maraming salamat po. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thanks again.